And hello, family. Wow. Good to be home. Yeah, it feels good to be home. We get to travel all over the place, uh, speaking from stages, but this is, it's great to be with you all. Uh, we've been praying about this, and we're confident that God has a nugget for you. That if you are either that one or the 10 that they were referring to, whether you're a good to great couple or you're a couple that's maybe in the process, what I wanna encourage you is God has something for you. There's gonna be something that he wants to speak directly to you. So, in order for that breakthrough to kind of happen and for us to build uh, our unity as a couple, we gotta make a pack, all right? You guys oh boy, ready to make a pack? Oh here we go with the pack making. So hubbies, you're gonna lead the charge. Grab that beautiful bride's hand. Look her deep in the eyes and repeat after me, baby. Baby. I'm going to learn something this weekend. I'm going to learn something this weekend. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and all the wives are just smiling. All right, ladies, we can't leave them hanging there. We got to look back and say, baby, it's about time. What? <laughs> you see what I'm dealing with, right? <laughs> no, 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 that's the point, all right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Here's the pact that we're making. No church elbowing. Mm. Right? I can't be sitting here thinking, boy, I sure hope Greg gets this one. And he can't be thinking, man, I sure hope the Holy Spirit's speaking to Julie today because she needs to get that one. We got to be able to apply the principle. So I want you to be on guard, be on the lookout for that nugget that the Holy Spirit wants to give to you for your breakthrough. So now, ladies, we can't leave our hubbies really hanging out there. So, baby, I'm going to learn something this weekend. All right. All right. <laughs> now, with that, give each other a high five, a quick kiss on the cheek, and let's get this party started. So with that, babe, why don't you give them a little bit? Everybody's been sharing a little bit of their journey. Why don't you tell them ours? Well, I'll tell a little bit of it. I won't tell a lot of it of it. But, um, you know, our story, if you're anything like us, first of all, I'd like to know a little bit about folks. I love that each one so far has talked just a little bit about their kind of finding one another journey and all that good stuff. So Julie and I, uh, our story is not like the other two that you've heard so far. Now, we did indeed have a wild whirlwind romance of dating and such that lasted all of six months, and then we found ourselves married. Don't know how that happened, but anyway, just kidding, because I could run faster than her and I caught her. But once we... Uh, <laughs> Once we got married, uh, then that's when the challenges really hit. Um, we had both been married previously, and we had both come from a pretty colorful background from childhood on up, a lot of brokenness. And so with that, we carried a ton of baggage into our marriage relationship, baggage we didn't know what to do with. We hadn't really seen what a successful marriage, what a happy, thriving marriage really looked like, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that, and so, um, but for me, and I'll own my piece, there's too much of hers for me to tell, I'll let her do that, <laughs> but for me, my, my big thing was, is that I had a terrible, violent, raging, uncontrolled, unbridled temper, and so with all of this brokenness from our childhood and previous marriage and lots and lots of hurt. Um, when I would become triggered, I would just be off. And here's the really sad part about it. I was kind of proud of my temper. Isn't that crazy? Um, I would brag about it sometimes. And so with, with some of the brokenness that Julie brought in, instead of loving her through those things, I felt like my job a lot of times really was to make sure that she wasn't thinking too highly of herself, that my job was to cut her down to size right? Make sure she knew her place. So, aren't you glad you're here ready to listen to us? <laughs> Jules? Yeah, so let's Greg take all the credit for our nearly early demise. L listen, guys, when we say that we fought passionately, you need to ratchet that up. We fought literally every single day for two years straight. Didn't miss one day without a heated argument. Um, Greg felt like he needed to cut me down to size. I felt like my job was to be his Holy Spirit. I thought my job was to 
help him have the convictions that he needed to have. And maybe I did. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I grew up in a family, though, where every abuse was present. So physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. I brought all of that junk into our marriage relationship because I never wanted to be defined by it and pretended it never happened. So it erupted in those first early years. So much so that, uh, again, our, our fights got a little bit um, violent. And with that, uh, Greg, when he felt like, you know, he, he had made these vows, and his vows were, I'm never going to let another woman control me. My vow was, I ain't ever going to let another man hurt me. And bam, the arguments, the accusations, the crazy psychotic jealous side of me, the raging side of Greg erupted for the, about the first seven years of our marriage relationship. So we were two Christians who loved one another passionately, but we fought just as passionately. And we loved Jesus with all of our heart, but we had no paradigm how to make him the center of our relationship and certainly how to implement the principles that we're gonna give you today. Absolutely, so uh, we don't share this with you because <clears throat> you know, we love airing out our dirt. <laughs> it's really because we want to give you hope because if God can bring us from where we were to where we are today in the thriving relationship that we have, um, wherever you're at, again, James and Lisa mentioned the, you know, the scale of one to 10, wherever you fit on that, we wanna encourage you that there's hope, there really is. And so thankfully, God didn't leave us in all of that rubble and all of that mess. Julie and I have had the privilege of owning and running several different businesses over the years. And as we did, we began to grow as people. We always were very focused on becoming better, becoming better leaders, um, staying really closely tied to our local uh, church body and such. And so we always wanted to become bigger and better all the time, certainly bigger on the inside than the outside, as John Maxwell might say. And uh, there were a couple of things that we stumbled on, and there's a whole bunch of things that we'd love to be able to share with y'all this weekend. And so we prayed about, and this is what we felt like God had for y'all tonight, or this morning. It's usually at night when we do this. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so to start out with, one of the things that really sets the way that we teach and the way that we approach the marriage relationship from our experience, different than many others that we've come encounter with, is that... It's, it's this thought. All thought leaders throughout time, they have disagreed actually on a lot of different things and in fact, sometimes they've even gone to war over the differences in what they believe. But one thing that all thought leaders all agreed on, and it doesn't matter if they're Baptist or if they're Buddhist or anywhere in between, doesn't matter what era of time they come from, they all unanimously agree on this one central principle. And that is that we become what we think about. We become what we think about. And you may be saying to yourself, self, what does it have to do with marriage? It has everything to do with marriage. In fact, the wisest man who ever sported a pair of flip flops said it this way. He said, as you think in your heart, so you become. Now, I want to do just a quick little demonstration just so that you understand how this works in real life. I'd like you to begin to look around the room, and I want you to begin to look for anything that you can find that is green. So start counting green things. Go ahead. You're counting green things. You never know. There might be a prize. Probably not, but you can keep counting green things anyway. You're counting green things. I want you to count how many things. You can count shirts. You can count hats. You can count somebody's teeth if they happen to have green teeth. <laughs> you can count shoes. You can count whatever you can find that's green. I'll go ahead and stop. Now, what I would like for you to do is to tell me how many things you counted that were red. Okay, so, all right, I tricked you on the bad guy. Go ahead and count red things. Go ahead, go ahead, start counting them. He's not I want to know how many you counted. Red, I'm going to ask red. you this time how many y'all counted, so go ahead. How many red things are you finding? How many red things? You're counting red things. All of a sudden, there's red stuff everywhere. Keep counting red. You're looking for red. Keep counting, keep counting, keep counting. Okay, stop. Now, how many y'all counted 10 things that were red or more? Several of you. Keep your hands up if you had 15. 
Got a few people out there. Okay, good. 20 or more? Y'all are very creative. Okay, so <laughs> here's the question. How many of y'all would be honest and say that, and I'm not asking you to answer out loud, but how many of you would be honest and say that maybe you counted some things that weren't exactly red? <laughs> You're chuckling. <laughs> maybe they were pink or a little purplish or a, an 80s color, mauve. Younger people are like, what? I never even heard of that before. The point is this. This is how our thinking plays out, right? We find what we're looking for. We become what we think about. We find what we're looking for, even if it's not there. Right? And so, many times we start out in our marriage relationship or in our dating relationship and we're putting our best foot forward. We're making sure that, you know, we're being our best, we're dressing for our best, we have a lot of grace for our mate. I certainly did for Julie. I know she had a lot for me because she looked past a lot of things and we ended up married. <laughs> but sometimes after we get the ring and we get that legal paper that says we're married and we got that lifelong big C word, commitment, right? There's a couple of other C words that enter into the picture after a little while. One of them is comfort. We get comfortable with one another. And this is a good thing. This is not necessarily a bad thing. But what sometimes accompanies comfort is complacency. And when we become complacent, then is when we start finding these things and we start hyper-focusing on them. And instead of being very purpose-focused or focusing on the things that we wanna speak life over, that we wanna see more of in our life, because again, if these thought leaders are correct, we become what we think about, we're doing the exact opposite of what we ought. Are you tracking? Right. I saw the light bulbs, come on, you are tracking. So we wanna make sure that we are focused on and that we're thinking about and that we're celebrating and speaking life over one another. Yeah. So, you know, I, I find that interesting because uh, doing what we do now, marriage ministry, fast forward 25 years, uh, God's did a lot of healing in our relationship. So we run into couples all the time and they're like, we just don't share anything in common anymore. There's just nothing. You know, and they've got their arms folded and their hearts have become callous to one another. Uh, they define themselves by their differences rather than looking for what they share in common like we do when we're dating, they define themselves by what is actually different. And they look at those differences as a bad thing, as a right or a wrong thing. So they look at one another, like he's a, he's a saver, I'm a spender, she's a night owl, I like to get up in the, the morning. And so as they define themselves by their differences, they become very problem aware. And so we like to shift that energy, but let me, let me just share this. You know, uh, Greg was talking about the red-green thing and how we find what we're looking for. The other thing that we realized in our marriage journey is that our mind was never created to think in reverse. So I'm gonna play a little game. You guys gonna play along with me? All right, so close your eyes. I promise I won't put anything nasty in your mouth. Just close your eyes. And for just a moment. Until she's used to being married to me. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do right now, don't picture a little white mouse. Don't, don't, don't see his little beady eyes and his little tw you know, twitchy nose. Don't see a little white mouse. Now, okay, you can open up your eyes. What happened? Saw a little white mouse. Even if it was just for a split second and then you tried to think about an elephant or something like that to scare the little white mouse away. You thought because our mind wasn't created, engineered to think in reverse. And so sometimes even if we're facing a struggle, it's like don't nag, don't complain, don't see how much he always leaves the toilet seat up. Just don't think about those things. Don't leave the toilet seat. Yeah. Don't leave the toilet seat up. <laughs> don't leave the toilet seat up. Right, we, we become problem aware and we can't see anything other than that issue. And so look, we're not saying that problems are bad. Problems are actually really a great thing because if nothing else, it helps us to identify what it is that we don't want in our marriage relationship. But the power comes when we flip it on its ear and we begin to do like we do with the couples who come to us very often. We don't share anything in common anymore. Right? 
We start to say, really? Well, can I ask you a question? Do you mind? And usually they'll concede because they came to us because they want marriage advice. And I'll begin to say, do you want to feel loved? Mm -hmm. Do you want to feel respected? Mm -hmm. do, you want to, do you want to leave a legacy for your kids that demonstrates love, acceptance, and forgiveness in your marriage relationship? And what are they doing? They're shaking their head. Time Magazine actually did an article. It was pretty interesting. And as they did all of this research, they, they discovered this one central truth. And the central truth that permeated again uh, throughout culture was that every spouse longs for a mate who sees them for who they are, accepts them for who they are, while bringing out the best in who they are. And so the question, as you sit in this room, if, you were, if we could have a one-on-one, -on -one, I would start by asking, what is it that you really want? What would you want to see more of in your marriage relationship? And I bet you, if I asked your spouse, they would share that as well. You may have just forgotten some of the hows, and that's what we're going to share with you today, some principles of how to build on common ground, thrive in your marriage relationship, and actually have friendship with your spouse. Good stuff. So let's talk about that just for a minute about, you know, okay, so great, it's an, a great idea. Let's build on common ground. How in the world do we begin to build on common ground if we're about to tear each other's face off, right? Or if we're just simply having some daily disagreements of sort, how do we learn how to handle these from a different perspective so that we actually can begin to build on common ground? And is that really important? Well, we just need to no, go no further than our own Bibles, right? The Bible tells us that a house divided won't stand. Gives us another, um, several different places, in fact, where it references where one will put a thousand to flight, two will put 10,000 to flight. Grant Cardone thought he came up with something cool, didn't he? But he didn't. God did. That's the 10X plan for marriages is fight for that unity and build on common ground. So, First of all, you have to discover what you both agree on to begin with, okay? And even in your disagreements, there are things that you agree on, okay? Now, in order for us to do this, I think practically we need to understand that in the process of discovering what we both agree on, we may need to keep it at a high level. Remember earlier, Julie talked about, do you both want peace? Do you both want uh, to feel loved? Do you both want to feel respect? Do you want legacy? You know, things of this nature. And so even if you have to start with some low-hanging fruit, you know, or 30,000-foot stuff that's easier, start there because it's the only way to build anything. Look, we don't have to go any further than American politics to figure out what happens. We begin to find ourselves by our differences, right? I mean, after all, we're all Americans. Same thing in our house, if we, if we focus in on and begin to identify ourselves and discover what it is that we agree on, then it gives us a bridge to begin to build down from there into some of the more deep and more specific things, but we have to start by building on common ground. And so, as we keep it as a high level, we wanna reduce, or excuse me, release the how and simply focus on that desired outcome. So this is exactly what Julie and I do, is we'll ask each other when we feel that tension and we. We, we catch there's a disagreement happening here, we'll be like, okay, what is it that we agree on in here? In other words, what is the desired outcome here that we can both share? And if we, once we land on what that shared desired outcome is, then we're able to kind of build the how from point A to point. Probably be better just to give them a live example. I was going to say, while he was talking, I was thinking about our household and our beautiful baby girls right up here in the front row. And if she were to describe our parenting... Guys, if we had a hot button in our home, it centered on parenting. Like some communication, some sex, for us, it, it all stemmed from parenting because Greg is a person of excellence. Well, thank you. Yeah, you and you are. <laughs> he has a way of finding how to make anything better. No, no, he does. <laughs> he is a maximizer. I'm not gonna change that attribute in him. And so his idea of parenting was to cause our kids and prepare them to be excellent, to be ready for the world, to be successful, to be able to hold their own. 
I came from a family, remember, where every abuse was present. I, I never can remember hearing that I was loved, so I overcorrected. And I was an encourager. And man, I just wanted them to know that they were loved that they were accepted, that anything they put their mind to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they could do it. So I'm an encourager by nature. And we headbutted all the time around those two different approaches. So let me just ask you, who was right? Did our kids need excellence? I think I heard somebody say Greg. <laughs> <laughs> no, they said right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Excellence or encouragement? both, but we were so busy asserting our opinions that we weren't accomplishing anything that we both desired. So we had to start from a high level because when we first started out, it was like, he wanted to say, woman, get those kids off your skirt tail. The world's going to spit them out and eat them up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I was using scripture against him. I was like, fathers, don't exasperate your children. It's like the ultimate trump card, right? isn't it? I mean, come on. Look, what do I do with that? You know, we're, we're making light of it today, but at the time, it wasn't light. So we had, to, we had to step way back and say, okay, let's practice what we preach. What is it that we want? Well, we want kids who know who they are, that can stand in the world, that they can give a good firm hit, that they're prepared to be successful. We want kids that know that they are loved unconditionally. And we want kids whose faith is their faith. They can't, our faith, we, we said it all the time, didn't we, Summer? We would say, our faith isn't enough for you. Someday you're gonna have to make that decision. So in our parenting, we stopped fighting with one another and st started fighting for the things that we shared at that high level. Now, these were conversations that we literally, because there was this reoccurring Y'all got any reoccurring things that sometimes cause you to hit a speed bump in your marriage? Or maybe feel like it's driving up completely off the tracks? This, again, was, was ours. And so at a time where the emotions were a little bit low and we could think more logically, we, we talked about this and, and asked ourselves, okay, what, what is the desired outcome? And so those were the answers. And so Pastor Todd and Julie talked a little bit this morning about creating culture in your home, right? Uh, and in your family, and so this was, our, our version of that is create an optimal environment for unity. And it's not just a once-off kind of thing. Again, I like the way that they referenced it because it is creating an, a culture in our home, and your home has a culture. Um, I've heard it said that with every room that we walk into, it either gets a little lighter or it gets a little darker. It gets a little warmer or it gets a little cooler. And you know, back in those early days, unfortunately, I think that mine would be more of the cool and more of the dark and so on and so forth. Like, oh, Lord, Dad's home, you know? And uh, as we learn to unify and, and, and celebrate our differences instead of trying to train, change one another, um, then we were able to come in unity and build a whole infrastructure for how our family would work based off of these, these questions of what it was that we wanted to achieve. So create an optimal environment and set your ground rules. Now, let's face it, sometimes the heat's on and it's, it's, we don't have the opportunity to uh, go to our happy place and make sure that we're in a neutral zone and all that good stuff. So when I say this, it's, it's more about creating a neutral zone in our mind and, again, creating that culture of, of, of respect and honor, like they mentioned earlier today. And so a few months ago, <clears throat> Julie and I had been running and gunning hard. We'd done multiple speaking engagements. We'd had several folks in our home for the marriage reboot, which, again, is that one-on-one -on -one thing they were talking about earlier and sometimes with less than a 24-hour period between turnovers. And so we were worn out. This had gone on for several months on end. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't honoring the Sabbath. We were just burning the candle at both ends seven days a week. And um, we began to kind of feel tension. Tension. Just a little. In our house. Like she was working on my last nerve is what I'm trying to tell you, Okay. And I'm pretty sure I was working on hers, too. It was like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you know, we were at that place where it was about to snap at any minute. And I remember trying to approach Julie in the right heart to talk about some things. I felt like 
we needed to talk about. And after several attempts, realized that it wasn't really going well. Now, we've been at this long enough, and we do practice what we preach. In fact, what we teach has been from our own blowing it, you know, and so that's how we actually learned it, is we screwed it up first. But uh, <laughs> it's true. Again and again and again. Yeah. But at this stage in the game, we will begin to take the right steps before things get too far out of hand. And so Julie, thankfully, had enough sense to say, hey, Greg, I, I really feel like we need to take some time to connect. Can I cancel our schedule for the next couple of days. Now, I understand not everybody can cancel their schedule for the next couple of days all the time. But I also understand that most of us are probably not working three, four months, day in, day out, literally with not a single day off either. So keep it within context, and I always like to say, don't let what you can't do keep you from what you can do. We get very focused sometimes on, well, I can't do this, I can't do that. That's disempowering thoughts, again, and our thoughts are powerful. So the question is, what can we do? Well, we were in a situation where it wouldn't cause too big of a ripple for us to begin to cancel some appointments and sneak off together for a couple of days, and so we did. And I left her in charge of the whole thing, because honestly, I wasn't in a good mental state to do it. So we've been away, it's been a couple of days, and I'm thinking, you know, we're going to be able to talk about some of these things. We just need to rest just a little bit. And so I think, what, two, three nights in a row? We were watching this beautiful sunset over on the opposite side of the state, and um, I'm like, this is probably, this is probably a good time to, to, to bring it up again. So, with the purest of heart, I'm trying to use all the skills that I've taught. Not so much. Still couldn't do it. <laughs> Literally, every evening for two or three nights, we tried to come back to these things, and she had her grievances, I had mine, and you know, it just, it just, it just wasn't going anywhere positive. So, what we did, we decided what we both wanted and what we both needed. And what we discerned is that what we needed more than solving any problems or even, you know, uh, diagnosing anything, it was a matter of us just simply falling apart in one another's arms and crashing, getting some rest, and having some fun together. And we've worked with hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of couples one-on-one, -on -one, thousands abroad, I suppose, but um, it is a very, very common thing that when we are in this season of life where things are a little bit tense and difficult, um, we've probably lost sight of how to have fun. And in the world of intentionality, and we all know how important being intentional is because we don't drift together, we drift apart, don't we? And so we really, we spent the next couple of days just having fun and resting, catching up on rest and enjoying one another. We never talked about one single problem, one single issue, one single thing that was giving us tension. Now, I'm not encouraging you not to talk about things. I'm saying you need to know yourself, right? And know what you need in the moment and know how to communicate with your spouse in such a way that y'all can discern, okay, maybe we just need a break. So, the cool thing is, is we've never had to come back and talk about, so I can't even remember what the things were that I was irritated about anymore because we, just needed rest. we healed, right. So, know yourself. There's, there's another thing that I, I wanted to add to this just very quickly, and, and sometimes uh, I can remember back several years ago, Julie might ask me if something was wrong. Something wrong with you? Are you okay? And have y'all ever done this? No, I'm fine. Why? You have done that, <laughs> okay. So, can I just ask you not to make your spouse feel crazy? <laughs> Listen, if I say something snide, or if I do something that's a little bit of a dig, and she calls me on it, I don't mean like this. I'm not gonna respond like, yeah, I did mean to dig at you, right? But I don't want to make her feel crazy like she don't know how to read body language or voice inflection and such, right? I think sometimes we get so caught up in trying to grind our ax, right, or make our point that we'll even twist what our spouse is saying to us so that we get the opportunity to make that point. And so what we've learned, of course, is again to go back to the old building of the common ground and to level. There's times when I'm just off my square and I'm in a bad mood. And instead of making her feel crazy, like she don't know really what's going on, I'll tell her, love, 
I may need a little extra grace today. I'm not sure if it's your fault or not. I'm still trying to figure that out. (laughs) I'm serious. (laughs) But I'm working through some things, and I'll try to rebound. I'm not asking for excuses or anything or, you know, to be let off the hook, but I may need a little extra grace today as well. And then the final thing there is delay having a conversation when you're tired, overly frustrated, feeling intentional, or excuse me, irrational, (laughs) or easily irritated. Again, remember the story I told you just a minute ago. I don't need to explain this point. You heard it in the story. We really were intentional about coming down and allowing ourselves to rest. And I wanna just make mention that sometimes, um, because we live in such a fast-paced society, we just simply need to slow down, don't we? And there's a, there's a place where in our conversations, again, we're talking about building on common ground and being able to have a, a, a profitable conversation, a healthy conversation, where what we need to do is we need to, instead of, instead of slinging accusations and judgment and or hearing from a place of, of, uh, of offendedness and such, we just need to slow the conversation down. There are two little glands that sit on top of your kidneys and they're called adrenals. And once those babies kick in, all of the blood drains from your brain into your outer extremities. You know this, but the reason it's important to understand is because when those emotions kick in, you're no longer thinking rational. You think you are, but you're not. And so when you begin to feel that, I wanna encourage you, just slow the whole conversation down and think about understanding what it is that your spouse is trying to communicate. Yeah, I love it. You know, and and Pastor Julie said she was kind of a stuffer, and and Todd wasn't afraid of, well, we were both fighters. (laughs) So we we didn't know how to slow it down, and, and so everything erupted. But we began to say, you know what, we don't want this. So if you want something different, you gotta gotta do do something something different. different. And we got tired enough, you know, change rarely takes place until the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of change. And we were at the point where we wanted some change. We knew what we didn't want and we needed to define what we did want. So as we're talking about coming together and we're talking about having that neutral place and space, this isn't an ambiance kind of a thing. This is a state of mind. And so the how to, how do you actually do that? When you feel something passionately, you gotta slow down, like Greg said. One of the rules that we began to implement was see the best, believe the best, and speak the best. So when we got ready to have a conversation, I literally wanted to see the best. I wanted to catch Greg doing something right, not something wrong. I wanted to believe he is a child of God. I wanna see him as that, as just another human being trying to make their way in the world, not my enemy. And so it was see the best, believe the best, and speak the best. So when I think back about our conversations about the kids and we were, you know, starting at a high level, the thing that we committed to was to fight for unity above all else. And so we both agreed that we were going to fight for unity above everything else, that we would be one no matter what. And that meant if I really had a strong opinion, I learned to keep my mouth shut until I could do it in such a way that it would be honoring to him to see the best, believe the best, and speak the best. Having the uh, uh, idea, again, that mind space, I am for you. You are my helpmate. We are one. Those kind of things that you can say to yourself. So I'm getting ready to give you a technique, though. That's worth the price of admission. Are you ready? This is the big one. I'm ready. (sighs) You're all baited. No, seriously, this changed for me how I could actually hear what he was saying. Let's go back to the kids. And we're in this conversation. And I remember, you know, Summer was our easy kid, so I'm just going to say it out loud. We had to be careful not to give Summer an opinion because if we gave her an opinion, she was going to go do our opinion. A compliant one. Glad we had one. Yeah, we had one out of the three. (laughs) All that to say, though, we were in one of our heated arguments, and I was so frustrated. And then all of a sudden, it was as if the Holy Spirit gave me this one-liner. It's like, Julie, you're fighting for your limitations. And I paused. And what I realized is I was resisting Greg and what he was saying, and I had to change the script that was going on in my mind. So here's the nugget. 
that next time you find yourself in opposition at that thing that you circle around all the time, rather than insert your rights, your thoughts, your opinions, pause and simply ask, how could they be right? Ooh, that's a doozy. If you can stop long enough, it'll change your filter to what is it that he's saying or she's saying that I actually agreed with. I was fighting for wanting my kids to not be successful. Are you kidding me? But I was so busy, so stepping back, I could go, you know what, babe? I actually agree with that. I completely understand what you're saying. I want that too. Now we're not in opposition, and it helped for us to both have listening ears then, because if your spouse feels affirmed, and you're saying, I totally get that, and I don't disagree, can I, can I ask another question? And then you can begin to have a dialogue that's healthy. Now, here's the thing. You can't say, oh yeah, I totally agree with that one. That's that voice inflection thing yeah, I was yeah. talking about? <laughs> It's got to be genuine. I remember my kids one time asked me, Mom, how do I come across as sincere? And without thinking, I said, be sincere. Right? What's in our heart will overflow. And so in this place, it's being able to genuinely say, I totally get that. I agree with that. When we do that, that's when we shift the energy in our household to begin to build on unity and friendship in our marriage relationship. I love the question, how can they be right? And Julie has so many of the great best practices that we might share led out in this, but I learned quick and begin to get on board as well. And it changes the whole dynamic of your conversations, especially if you're having a disagreement, because again, so often we're focused on what we disagree on. And again, a house divided, right? Remember all that stuff? When we focus on what we agree on, then it gives us the bridge to begin to build. And there's way more times, honestly, between the two of us, if the fur's getting ready to fly, if I'm ready and, you know, to, to pounce, then when I ask that question, what do I agree with what she's saying, then I'm able to listen from a different perspective completely and it changes the whole dynamic of the conversation. The next thing that we want to offer to y'all that, that has really helped us um, in some of the more heated moments is to listen um, to understand rather than to be heard. So create an environment where your, your spouse feels like you're listening to them and, and listen for understanding. So I think a practical way of, of stating this really is, is listen for understanding not for reply. You know, we're not great listeners here in America. Um, again, life moves pretty fast. There's lots of different demands, lots of different things uh, pulling at us, lots of different needs. And sometimes I find myself, when I'm off my square, I'm shadow boxing. I'm not even having a conversation that has anything to do with what's really, but I am assuming what she's thinking and then if she's trying to um, express herself, I'm busy loading my gun, right? I'm getting ready to make my next comment, so I'm not even really listening to what she's saying. Is there anybody else out here human? Okay, just wanna make sure we was in the right place. <laughs> With those lizard aliens or whatever they talked about earlier. <laughs> but, when, but, when we, but when we slow down, when we make a conscious effort to slow down and we ask ourselves, okay, what do I agree with that this person is saying? And then we listen to understand. First be understood, then seek to be, seek, it's easy for me to say, right? First seek to understand and then be understood. When we practice this in our marriage, then it, it keeps us from having bombs that we have to defuse in our marriage, right? And it allows, instead of so much of this up and down emotion, it really smooths everything out to where we're able to, and I'm able to communicate with her in love. And then when I do reply back to her, then I'm able to ask a question to make sure that I understand what she's saying because I'm thinking, instead of about my point, what is her heart trying to communicate to me? What's, what's she really saying? And it, again, completely changes the dynamic in the way that we communicate, especially sometimes around some sticky 
subject matter. Right? Yeah, I love, you know, the ask questions. It's pan and back. And again, it's the posturing of our heart to want to really discover like we did when we were dating. Remember when you, we dated, we looked for what we shared in common. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. He talks about if there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation in the Spirit, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, united in Spirit. And so if we could begin every single day, I'll tell you this simple practice, before my feet, because we were volatile guys, and when I look back at what we do now and what we almost gave up, we couldn't see a way forward, but we wanted something different. And so we chose to do something different. And I believe that the Holy Spirit's gonna give you, you, not your spouse, remember, no church album, one way that you can have more fun, more connection, more unity in your marriage relationship, and it begins with you. For me, what God told me to do every single day before I put my feet on the floor, I simply asked him, God, show me one way to demonstrate love to Greg today. Help me to see one way that I can serve him. Help me to find what I love about him, not what's lacking. And it changed everything. And so that whole constellation of the spirit, unity, be of the same mind. When you feel an opposition, step back like we talked about and ask yourself, what are they saying that I agree with from that high level? Begin there and you're gonna see the unity. Now, you know, I love that one of the things, I think it was Pastor Todd or Julie that said, um, be careful who you're traveling with, right? Who's in the back seat with you? We'd love to be in your back seat. We'd love to encourage you. And because you're a church family, we've never done this before. I don't know that we'll ever do it to, again, but we wanna give you a gift. And the gift is about $247 in value. So everybody grab your phone out. This is the only time you can have your phone out during this unless you're taking notes. But what we want to encourage you to do is to text the word family, F-A-M-I-L-Y. I think we have it up she on the She did board. that for me because... <laughs> I'm like family. Text the word family to the number 33777. So you're going to text to the number 33777, the word family in the body of the message. And as you do that, uh, it's going to ask for your email, your first name, last name. Again, this is just for us. We're not going to sell it to anybody else. It's just for us to give you a free gift. And it's 10 videos. And those 10 videos are going to help to lead you how to fight for, how to dream together, how to tame your tongue, uh, how to actually implement Christ as the center of your home but to go from good to great or to bring uh, the unity into your home. So please let us sit in your back seat, text 33777, text the word family, and we wanna give you a gift to be your travel companions. Good stuff, everybody likes free stuff, so get you some free stuff. Get it up there on the screen. So um, also- Oh, wait, hey, real quick. Yeah, yeah. The videos are short too, so guys, don't worry about it. We promise, no, no deep gazing, it's, it, it's gonna be good. <laughs> it's a good ad. Blaine and Alexis, so as they're coming up to uh, dismiss us, um, out at the lobby, as you come in, kind of over towards the kids area, um, there is a book and a workbook that goes with the video series. Um, you're welcome to pick that up. It's not absolutely necessary, but we'd love for you to have that as well. And then there's some other resources out there so that we can stay in your back seat and keep you encouraged. God bless y'all. Thank you for your attention.